Hey everyone out there on the interwebs, my name's Langdon Cook and I am here at Blake Merwin's Fly Shop, the Gig Harbor Fly Shop, to uh, read a little bit from my new book called Upstream, Searching for Wild Salmon from River to Table. Uh, and so I picked out a passage, Blake, which I thought you would enjoy. Um, I will just give a little backstory. We met talking about mushrooms, right? You, I think, texted me out of the blue. I had no idea who you were. Um, I might have given you a little bit of intel. I can't exactly remember. Uh, but you returned the favor months later by giving me a text out of nowhere saying, hey, come on down. I've got a kayak group going out. It was a pink salmon year. I think it was two years ago. And uh, we went out into the industrial waterway of uh, Commencement Bay, right? And fished for pinks very successfully as I recall, from kayaks, which is my only uh, kayak fishing experience. Although I've been well aware, you know, of this whole sort of subculture that exists out there. And I had a blast, that was super fun. Uh, so I have a chapter in the book, which actually takes place north of Tacoma in Seattle, where I live, uh, in the Duwamish, which is our working waterway. Uh, waterway is the term that some people use as opposed to river, whatever that means, right? Um, and uh, it's a super fun site as well. So it's got a lot going for it. Uh, I don't know. I like to celebrate it because it's where I live and I can still fish out my back door uh, with the trash compactors and Boeing test flights coming in to land at Boeing Field. and. You know, it's it's a lot of fun. So I go out there with a bunch of guys that I know, m many of whom live in West Seattle, uh, and uh, like our friend over here. And uh, every two years, we get together, a bunch of us, and we call it Herding the Pinks. And that's what this chapter is called. It's called Herding the Pinks. Uh, so sort of a celebration of salmon culture in the more developed parts of salmon country. Uh, and you know, the possibility that we can still hold on to this wonder, wonderful resource even in a bustling city if we take care of it. Uh, so I'm going to read a few pages here in honor of our day out on the water. On a clear windless morning just before Labor Day, the herders, as they called themselves, met at Duwamish Waterway Park for what would likely be the last time that season to commemorate their beloved urban fishery. Connected by the internet, they came from Seattle, Portland, Yakima, Spokane, Bellingham, and elsewhere. They hauled analog age kicks, kick boats, rafts, canoes, aluminum tubs, and other barely seaworthy vessels down to the river's royally edge. Some of them I knew only from message board banter by their screen names. There was Trout Hole and Bubba, Blue Stimmy and Snap Dad. In a semi-ironic nod to the Wild West of Zane Gray, they called this roundup the herding of the pinks. The herders were mostly fly fishermen. Every other year in odd numbered years, they circled their sea wagons in the busy commercial waterway to fish and enjoy one another's company. Everyone had his own theory about when the bite was best. We're too early, Foghorn worried. He had come up from Portland and preferred high tide. Give me an incoming tide, yelled Paul over the ambient noise of a trash compactor working steadily on a diet of wrecked cars. Paul, who had been actively fishing the pink run since, since it first started ramping up in Puget Sound in the early 90s, probably knew more about catching these salmon than anyone. But I wouldn't bet my life on it, he demurred. Fish are always unpredictable. Mostly our preferences were based on past performance more than any studied triangulation of moon, tides, barometer, and whatever else might seem vaguely scientific. My own inclination was more in line with Paul's. It seemed reasonable that energy-conserving fish would nose into the river with a rising tide at their backs. As we suited up, my friend Steve rode up on his pontoon boat, greeted by a chorus of raspberries. Got my limit, he said with typical angler's brevity, deflecting any questions about where or what fly he was fishing. Steve beached his craft and wrestled a cooler with six iced pink salmon off the back. Time to tend the smoker. 
This is as much a time-honored skill as the fishing itself. The fish needs to be filleted, brined overnight, rinsed off, air dried for a few hours, and then smoked. Serious smokers tinker with their brining recipes relentlessly, trying exotic herbs and spices, adjusting the ratio of salt to sugar, adding new ingredients such as molasses or pineapple juice or cayenne pepper, and that's just for the brine, which is meant to leach out some of the water in the meat and, pr and replace it with a preserving mixture of salt and sugar. The type of wood used as the smoking agent is also critical, alder, cherry, and apple being just a few of the usual varieties. As is the style of, of the smoker itself, mine uses burning coals rather than an electric element and keeps the meat properly moist with a water pan placed just above the fire. Smoking salmon is an art and pastime, occasioning lawn chair, fire poker, and six pack of beer. The finished product, if well executed, will have a salty sweet crust and succulent interior. Pink salmon, we all agreed, are best smoked. A photographer known as Nope snapped a shot as we all got ready to launch. Okay gang, he called out, twirling a fist in the air with an imaginary lariat. Head him up and move him out. A dozen pairs of oars dug into the dirty water and we made for the middle of the channel as a flotilla, passing an anchored tug and a barge the size of a, des of a desert atoll. The barge, everyone noted with dismay, was parked right in the middle of the best fishing grounds from two years earlier. One guy, who went by the internet handle Unfrozen Caveman, from a Saturday Night Live skit about a Neanderthal on the loose in modern society, puttered past us in his new wooden dory. He and his son had spent the intervening two years building it themselves in the garage. A little outboard mounted on the stern steered them into range ahead of everyone else, and he let fly with a paleolithic cackle. The herders formed a circle, corralling a school of pinks, and started casting. Paul hooked the first fish and paddled out of the circle with his fins to land it, while the rest of us redoubled our efforts. My rod was a nine-foot model designed for large trout, my reel hand-tooled from anodized airplane-grade aluminum to protect against the salt. I was using a clear sinking line of about 15 feet in length that enables the fly to get down a few inches in the water column where a fish is more apt to strike. When they're on the bite, Pinks will take flies at any depth and even right on the surface, which is unusual for salmon. My fly was fuchsia colored with dumbbell eyes, tied in the crazy Charlie style, which is to say sparsely, with a slim crustacean look to it. Though fly choice is not crucial, hot pink is by far the favorite color, and sometimes chartreuse. What these two colors have in common is hard to know. I cast 40 feet and stripped the fly back with a fishy looking retrieve. This is probably the most contested part of the technique. Fly anglers will argue on behalf of slow retrieves, fast retrieves, and any number of speeds in the middle, as well as varying the strip with a quick jig or simply letting the fly hang suspended for a moment. All methods seem to take fish, though certain techniques will be more profitable on a day-to-day -day or even hour-to-hour -hour basis for reasons that are mostly beyond the fisherman's understanding, no matter what he may claim. Thirty yards downstream, a dorsal fin broke the surface, and the fish rose nearby. This behavior, the splashy porpoising and tail chasing, is yet another behavior that isn't properly understood. Is the salmon acting territorial? Is it responding to a change in salinity, to its own physiological changes? Most anglers believe the strike is a form of aggression, a way of the fish to assert its seniority, or perhaps a foreshadowing of the competitiveness that kicks in once the fish are paired up on the spawning grounds. The fishing lure isn't food so much as something to be dominated. In any event, pinks spend a lot of time near the surface where they're susceptible to flies. Sometimes the schooling fish, which are known to follow shorelines, barges, and other shadowy underwater structures as they move upstream, appear to get confused by the armada of fishermen in their pontoon boats and start slashing wantonly at any fly in front of them. Why they do this is a mystery. 
As with so much of fish biology, so much of nature in general, we don't know the answers. We can only hope that the objects of our study will be around long enough to one day reveal their secrets. The fish boiled again. I aimed my fly for what trout fishermen call the ring of the rise and stripped it back. A swirl appeared behind my fly and then I felt the take, an electric jolt that buzzed through my body, lighting up ancestral bulbs like a well-played pinball machine. Just the same, a five pound pink on a light fly rod is a thrill. A good fish will tow an angler on a pontoon in circles for a few minutes before it can be tired out and landed, and many fish are lost right at the boat during the frenetic low angle process of trying to net the thing without dumping into the drink. Once the fish was safely in the net, I secured my rod and removed the barbless hook required to protect endangered runs. It was a very large male, at least six pounds, still silver from the salt, but showing the green upper body of a fish beginning its spawning transformation. I've caught a few pinks even larger, though most are three to five pounds. I slipped a finger through the mouth and gill for a good grip, brandished my net handle in my other hand, and performed the necessary chore. The fish quivered, and its eyes stared blankly. I put down the net across my saddlebag and used my free hand to tear the gills on both sides so it could bleed out. Pound for pound, pinks have more blood than any other species of salmon, and that blood can taint the meat if not given a careful letting. A few spurts from the still pumping heart cascaded down the fish's body, turning it a dark crimson. I washed it off in the water before using my knife to cut a slit from anal fin to the gill and removing all the internal organs. Now it was ready to be put in the cooler lashed behind my seat. I would fillet it, I would fillet it later at home. Before I could get my fly back in the water, Paul was into another fish. The horn blast of a container ship out on Elliott Bay echoed across the water momentarily drowning out the noise of Boeing Field to our south. I spotted the unfrozen caveman across the river in his homemade boat, reaching for his own net. He was fishing in the shadow of a giant barge, one of many that dock in the waterway, its hull freshly painted blue. The barge towered over him like a steep, brilliant cliff. His young son stood in the bow, wearing a bright red life vest, trying to hold on to a spinning rod that was suddenly alive in his hands. I've got one, the boy declared across the river, a phrase as old as language itself. I've got one, I've got one, I've got one. Thanks. <laughs>